welcome to the Packing House. My name is Pastor Rick. If I've not been able to meet you guys yet, welcome to Sunday night. You're going to find out in a few short minutes why they keep us here on Sunday night. We have a lot of fun here tonight. Um, I'm going to get the house lights on for you guys. We're going to turn those house lights on so we can all read our Bibles, even though we're going to have them on the screen. Will you turn in your Bible over to 1 Thessalonians 5, and we're going to start at verse 1. So here we go, starting at verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Let's stop there and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we have a time to worship you in song, Lord. Lord, as we choose to worship you with our minds, God, by studying your word, we pray that the truth of scripture would inspire us, Lord. Lord, simply put, as, as I see often, we wish to see Jesus, Lord. So help us to see him clearly. Understanding your plan for us, Lord, help us to apply these truths to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're just joining us, it's your first time coming on Sunday nights. We, uh, here at the Packing House, we go book by book. We're in, the bo we're in the book, rather, letter to the Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul, he wrote a letter to the Thessalonians to encourage them. He had spent three weeks with them, teaching and preaching, encouraging them. And then he had to bail because <laughs> it's not how Paul was, it's just... Man, he would get to a new town, and then he would preach. Riots would break out, and he would have to bug out. It's actually, in, in, when you're in um, seminary, they call it the Pauline cycle, that little cycle that he does when he shows up. I don't know if that's me or not, but it's pretty consistent now. Um, so he writes this letter to encourage him. In this letter, at each chapter, he talks a little about what's going to happen in the end times. Last week, we were in the rapture, which is simply put to be caught up. It's when Jesus comes and he catches up. He takes his bride with him. Can we transition to a uh, handheld, one of these handhelds? Excuse me. Okay, so here, so where was I? Oh, the rapture. So last week we learned that Jesus was coming to get his church, the bride. He's going to catch all the believers up in the sky. Wow, that's pretty intense if you've never heard that before. So, at the, so what we saw in 1 Thessalonians 4 is Jesus comes to take the church. Well, see, the reason why Paul brought this up is because the Thessalonians were worried about Hey, what happens? What's going to happen with everyone who's died before us that loves the Lord? Paul writes, don't worry, don't worry. Because they're going to precede us. And the Lord is going to take up his church before the time of tribulation. And that's what we're actually going to talk about a little bit tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about the tribulation. 
See, I wish I would have said this last week about the rapture. Think about the rapture. If we're all caught up, those of us who are alive, we wouldn't taste death. I think this is one of the most merciful ways to go because then my kids wouldn't have to endure losing their dad. I would never have to endure another loss. I just think how merciful. So when we're praying that model prayer, Lord, thy kingdom come, I'm like, Lord, come quickly. Right now would be really good. In this moment, it would be great that he would catch up his church, his bride, the believers in Jesus Christ. We're not going to be here when God pours out his anger upon sin in the tribulation, okay? So that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about living hopefully and expectantly in light of the knowledge of this day of the Lord like we read. Did you hear that? We're, we're learning, we're training, we're equipping ourselves to live expectantly in light of the knowledge of this day of the Lord, this tribulation, this time of Jacob's trouble as the Lord, uh, as the Bible calls it. Let's dig in. It's a fascinating scripture. What I've been trying to, what I've been wrestling with all week is, as I've heard other people share this sermon, is I want to be sensitive that I don't scare anyone. Because that's not what God is doing here. He's not trying to scare anyone into heaven. That's not what God does. He doesn't scare anyone into a relationship with him. It's always God's love. That's the effective tool that he uses, God's love to bring people into a close relationship with him. That's why I'm prefacing this passage tonight, is that we have this knowledge of a loving father who's already taken his church, and he's going to use this time of tribulation to turn hearts away from sin and toward him. So it's... It's with that preface that we're going to get into our story tonight, into our passage tonight. So verse 1, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Like everyone, for the last couple thousand years, we've all wanted Jesus' timeline. We want to know when it's going to happen. So many people have written books. I remember as I'd hear on the news or hear on the radio how someone would say, it's going to be November, blah, 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 at this time. And I would be sitting there at work going, anytime now, Lord. Right now would be good. And then it would go. Jesus himself said no one would know. The term times and seasons can be translated as chronos or chronology, meaning they, they want to know the exact time, but they, they want to know well, what are the characteristics of the time. Now, we do have prophecy. Prophets were people that were God's messengers, to simply put it. They would confront people with this, their sin, or they would share God's message with them, these prophets. And if you want to get a detailed look at this time of tribulation and what's going on, you can read Ezekiel 36, or excuse me, 37, 38, and 39. We've seen some of this prophecy come true. Like Israel, it's a nation. They speak the same language. That's a big thing. Paul himself, he doesn't know the exact timing. It's a secret. Do I need a switch? Is that me cutting out? Okay, you let me know. I'm looking at my sound guy. Okay. Okay, so last week we talked about the rapture. It's an event that's going to take place that will affect the church. Every believer in Jesus Christ is going to go with him. But Paul now is changing the subject. The rapture happens. Seven years of tribulation is going to happen. That's this day of the Lord. It's marked by various developments. And I'm going to switch one more time, okay? Okay. And then I'm going to have you get an XLR for me, a cable and whatnot. Great. 
So it's a time marked by divine judgments, celestial like disturbances, natural disasters, terrible plagues. Paul, what he does is he's condensing everything in these few short verses, which Revelation takes like 10 chapters to unfold that you can, that you can read more about. Verse 2, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now, I talked a little bit about the day of the Lord. I'm going to tell you what it's not. It is not a 24-hour period. This is a season. It is this time of tribulation. It's, the, it's, a, it's a time where God is like rapidly, rapidly advancing his agenda to the end of the age. So we see this tribulation, then we see Jesus will return after all those battles happen, and then we have this like thousand year reign of Christ. Now I realize that if this is the first time hearing this, you're like, whoa, what is going on? And what I want to encourage you is dig into scripture. This whole Bible, if I could say it in just a, like 10 seconds or less, the left side of the Bible, the Old Testament, is Messiah's coming. The New Testament starts out with, he's here. The rest of the Bible talks about what we're supposed to do with it. And then the end is, he's coming back. And that's what we're dealing with tonight, is what's happening. He's coming back. Okay, so the day of the Lord is, the, is a time when God is going to pour out his anger on sin. That's what the day of the Lord is that we're talking about. It's a time when God pours out his anger upon sin. You've heard me say this before. The only time God gets angry, the only time we ever saw Jesus get angry, is when someone or something gets between him and his kids. God is the perfect heavenly father. Get between me and my kids and it ain't gonna end well for one of us. God's even more of a protector. He, he, he won't let anything get between him and his kids. Sin is the barrier between us and the Lord if we don't have Jesus Christ. This, there's a purpose of this tribulation he does not want anyone to perish. It says here in 2 Peter, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone to come to repentance. And this time of tribulation, the Bible calls it it's, it's a terrible time. Isaiah 13, 6, wail for the day of the Lord is at hand. This day of the Lord, 2 Peter 3, 10 calls it, um, says it's unexpected like a thief in the night. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. This does not sound good. I mean, literally, it was called Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30. Pastor Rick, are you kidding me? I missed the Super Bowl for all of this? Aren't you glad you came to church? I'm telling you, a smarter pastor would have skipped right onto this and just like preached John 3.16 at you the whole time. But you're not so lucky. You got me. Welcome to Sunday nights. I told you you'd see why they keep us here on Sunday nights. <laughs> but there's good news. Because church, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we get to just go and hang out in eternity with Jesus and bypass all this. Oh, then God's just going to leave all these humans to deal with the mess? Remember, he's the perfect heavenly father. So we got to trust his judgment. He's using it so that none would perish. That he wants them to come to a time of repentance. Repentance means change their mind, walk away from sin, walking toward God. That's what he's hoping for. Isn't that cool? Verse 3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. He says, all is well. Everything's quiet and peaceful. Then all of a sudden disaster will fall upon them as suddenly as a woman's birth pains begin when her child is born. And these people will not be able to to get away anywhere, because there won't be any place to hide. 
this is going to happen. People are going to be sitting there thinking, hey, it's all good. Everything's fine and dandy. And then, bam, like, it's sudden, like labor pains. It's sudden, this, this, this event. I remember when my first daughter was about to be born. I'm sitting down at the kitchen table, and I'm doing some work. And I hear my name being called through the house. And I'm like, what's going on? And then my in-law says, Rick, the water. I'm like, what, what? Oh, that water. I made like a 20-minute drive in about 10 minutes. I mean, we made it. We... And here's what I'm thinking. There was no stopping. <laughs> there was no going back. That baby was coming. There is no going back when this starts. It's coming. It is swift. It is certain. And it will be severe when this tribulation starts to happen. It will happen. That's what he's getting at as he's trying to to tell them that there's a certainty. There's a suddenness. It's inevitable. But this sorrow, this pain of judgment, it's giving birth to the kingdom of the Lord because God's son, Jesus, returns with great power and great glory. Like, yeah, the tribulation happens, but the Bible tells us how it ends. Jesus is victorious. God is victorious. We are to live expectantly, knowing, believer, how it all ends. Remember last week, you guys were wondering how was he going to wrap up Back to the Future, Marty McFly and Doc Brown in his message. I was saying how Marty goes back into time to go with all that knowledge that he had of the future, and he helps his parents out. We know how it's all going to end, we're sitting here in present time when we're supposed to live expectantly. Expectantly? That's how you say that word. With the hope and knowledge that we have, we're supposed to live. He goes right here, verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. You're not going to be surprised. In fact, you won't even be here because the rapture happens. What he's saying is this information shouldn't surprise you guys. Because you're not in darkness. You're, you're well informed. You're not in the dark about these things, brothers and sisters of the church. That's what he says when he's saying brethren. You're not even going to be here. You won't be overtaken by this. But this is what's going to happen. Verse 5. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of night or of darkness. He says you're children of the light. You're children of the day. Here's why. Because you're all in Christ. We see throughout the Bible that Christ, the Lord, God, light is always a good symbol for him. He is light, right? I didn't mean to rhyme. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to reflect the light. That's what we're supposed to do. Our lives are supposed to reflect our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why when, we, when I'm praying, as I'm saying, like, Lord, inspire us and help us to apply it. I love that people get inspired on Sunday night, but y'all have to be appliers Monday morning. Me too. That's one of the hardest things is to be inspired and then continue to be, to be applying it. That's what we're supposed to do with this information. Like we've learned in the past. Anybody wear sunscreen out there? You guys wear sunscreen? How, yeah, I don't wear too much sunscreen. Just right here. This is like the only place I get burned. Sunscreen doesn't work too well in the bottle, huh? It doesn't work at all in the bottle. You have to get it out, apply it to your life, and then you got to walk in it. This Bible is nothing more than a doorstop dust collector unless you open it up, get God's word, Apply it to your life and walk in it. That's how it works. We are, we are sons and daughters of the light, sons and daughters of the day. We're not of night. We're not of darkness. He's telling us to live expectantly. We must live and behave and act in light of Jesus' return, realizing, realizing that we have opportunities for service and sharing on earth. We're supposed to live with eternity's values in our heart. 
You've heard me say, stay ready so you don't got to get ready. You know where I got that from? From my Thursday night Bible study. A bunch of gangbangers from Southern California were teaching over things like this. And I go, what do you think this means, guys, to live expectantly and what you're learning? And a uh, big gangbanger tells me, so all Pastor Rick sounds like you got to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. I'm all, that's biblical truth. That's right. We're to live expectantly. We're supposed to make use of every opportunity to reflect the light of Jesus. So go out there and just shove your Bible down people's throats and post all you want and offend people. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, I love what uh, St. Francis Assisi said. Preach the gospel. And if necessary, use words. It was, there was an exercise I was running our first service junior high through. I was asking them, how do you live like your lives like this? How do you live your lives like this? If you weren't going to say anything about Jesus, how would people even think you were into Jesus? 11, 12-year-old kids were telling me, well, I could be kind to people that torment me. <laughs> That's a good one. I can worship in public. I'm like, there's another great one. They were talking and, and spitballing with each other, the 20 or so of them, about how they can just act like they love God and act like Jesus. It was pretty cool. They were sharing ways that their lives could reflect their relationship with Christ. And with all this information of knowing that Tribulation would be coming. Like, how could we share? How could we share the gospel? Okay, let's look at verse six. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. He's saying, be on guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. He's using some military terms here, like a soldier standing guard as a sentry. He's saying, be alert, stay alert and be sober. He's talking about us not slipping in to a spiritual slumber. We're not supposed to doze off spiritually. There's this thought that instead of actively engaging with the world and, and working, it, working to make it a better place, that some believers might adopt the attitude, like this passive attitude of, you know what, I'm just going to check out, and I'm going to let Jesus just sort out everything. That's not what he's saying. He's actually saying, be on guard. Be sober-minded. Be clear-headed. We're learning to live in expectantly in light of the, re uh, the return of Christ. There's many issues around that we need to be alert on. I mean, any number of issues, even politically and socially, and people now are going, here we go. He's going to start pol being political. No, we don't do that here. We just teach Jesus. But I'll tell you, we have not just an opportunity, but a responsibility, believer, to influence our households, to influence our communities, to be, uh, be a positive impact in our church. Yes, I pray that we all vote in light of what we're getting from the Lord in his word. Be strong and resolute in that. Be sober and be clear-headed. Be focused on these things. Don't allow our culture to dictate the Bible. No, that's not how that works. We flip that. Our Bible, our, our, the word of God that we have, it's supposed to dictate culture. It dictates our lives, not the other way around. Verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. He's starting to slip into this point of protecting your mind. As we're living expectantly, as we're in the world, we're supposed to be protecting our mind. Here's why I'm getting there. Verse 8 says, but let us who are of the day, be sober, he says again, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. 
He's saying that he wants us to keep our confidence in the Lord, to love him and love others. We heard about this idea of being on guard, staying ready, this idea of like a sentry on guard. Paul knew a lot about what Roman guards look like. May I have my slide? Uh, let's keep this up in-house, please. So we've already met faith, hope, and love back in 1 Thessalonians 3. But here they're described as armor to protect us in this evil world. A good study on armor is Ephesians 6. We hear about um, the shield of faith. We hear about the uh, sandals of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. We hear about all that in Ephesians 6 to combat spiritual warfare. The strategies of the devil were actually told to stand firm, to stand firm. Let's first talk about this breastplate that he talked about. The, a, bre a breastplate is meant to guard vital organs. When I worked at the police department, I was given a bulletproof vest, and in the middle of the bulletproof vest from a from about the breast line down to the, uh, my navel is a steel trauma plate. And the steel trauma plate is supposed to be there to, to take close rounds or to protect us from a knife if it, if it got too close to us. This idea that we're to have a breastplate of faith and love, confidence in the Lord will protect you. Protect those vital organs. That's vital. When you're going through suffering, when you're going through tragedy, when you're going through doubt, it's like faith is like this big thing. Who are you going to have hope in? Hope to hope? No, it's a pretty bumper sticker, but come on. Hope, we're in Jesus Christ. He is the object of our hope. Love, we're supposed to love God with everything we got. And love others the same. This is like something that protects us. It's a vital protection to us. Well, then he goes on to talk about the helmet and the hope of salvation. Okay, the helmet protects the head. You guys are probably wondering why I, I have this up here. Let me tell you. That is, for all you car guys, the unicorn. It's a 1965 Mustang, and the guy right there, he's dead now, but his, I don't know if you guys knew that Ken Block died. Ken Block would make that thing sing around. Oh, it's so cool. Okay, there's a reason. I'm not just geeking out on this cool stuff. Helmet, uh, the hope of, the helmet of salvation, right? So Ken Block, what he does is he actually, it's funny, when you see a guy who's like a stunt driver and whatnot, and a rally car racer, you would think, Really, does he care that much about safety? He had this statement, and he would say, he would say this. He said, if you have a $10 brain, then get a $10 helmet. So his helmet line is called a brain bucket, a brain bucket, because he knew that you got to protect that nugget <laughs> at all costs. Well, hope, this helmet of hope, it's in, hope is an expectation of salvation. Hope. The reason why we hope, what hope is, it's a trustful expectation in what God has already done. And our hope guarantees our participation with what he's doing in the future. God has done some incredibly marvelous things to deliver his people. He's done some amazing things to the people in this room. I've, I've been told some of your testimonies by you yourselves. I have a great testimony. Man, it's like we hit the jackpot with the Lord. And so if he could do that in the past, shouldn't we participate in what he's going to do in the future? So we need to protect our minds with hope. If you're going to have a brain bucket of salvation, it's like this constant reminder of who God is. This constant reminder that we have security in God, that we are assured in God that we have salvation, that we have an eternal home with him. That's what gets us through these tragic times in life. That's what gets us through the valleys, is having hope. 
knowing where we'll spend eternity, knowing that God is in control, that he is loving and he loves you. And if you need a verse to have some confidence in it, because I'm all about, well, what does the Bible say? 1 John 5.13 says, I have written these things to you, or I have written this to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God. It gets good right here. So that you may know you have eternal life. Not so you could wish upon a star. Not so you can get that little troll doll and rub his hair for good luck. No. He says, K-N-O-W, that you will know that you have eternal life if you believe in the name of Jesus Christ. And there's a real battle for our minds. There's a real battle for our minds. Well, let's go on to verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what God's doing is he chose to save us through our Lord. He's not trying to, he doesn't want to pour out his anger. He wants salvation through the Lord. In fact, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Right? 3, 17 says that he did not send his Son into the world to condemn, judge it guilty, harshly judge it. No, he didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. John 3, 17. See, it goes right in with what we're reading in verse 10 who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Paul takes a quick, quick peek back at the rapture, and he says, dude, you guys are, he didn't say, dude, I'm sorry, that's a slip. He's all, dude, bro. No, he didn't, Paul didn't probably talk like that. It's the Pastor Rick translation. He says, you guys are loved ones of the Bible. Uh, you guys are the loved ones of the Lord. We're going to be joined together with him in eternity. And he says, so we should live. Believer, we're not going to die. I don't mean, I mean, physically, we're going to die unless he raptures us, then all right. But the research is in, like Pastor Ed always says, 10 out of 10 people, they die. But what happens after death? Are you with the Lord in eternity forever or separated from the Lord? It's your choice. So in light of all this, we have verse 11. He says it again. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. He says, encourage each other. Remember, encourage? Courage means being scared to death, but saddling up anyways, as John Wayne said. If you guys don't know who John Wayne, he's cool. He's a cowboy and a firefighter and a pilot. He did amazing things. He's an actor for anyone under 40. We're supposed to put that courage into others, to encourage people. Okay, we're supposed to encourage. And then he says this word, edify, which means build each other up. And he tells the Thessalonians, because he's heard such good things about these guys, he goes, guys, you're already doing it. Just keep on keeping on. Do what you're doing, keep doing it. The message translation of this verse says, build up hope so, you, so you'll all be together in this. No one left out. No one left behind. I know you're already doing this. Just keep doing it. Here's the pastoric translation. Guys, I want the whole enchilada in there. Just trust in the Lord. Encourage each other. Build each other up. Don't use this information to scare the crud out of each other and, and have church divisions over this. No, when I lay down these prophecies, I want you to comfort one another. When you learn this information in light of this information, I want you to live expectantly, taking every opportunity to share the good news that Jesus loves, that Jesus forgives, that God gives grace to people, that he's merciful to people. Don't squander these opportunities. Man, we have talked about a lot tonight. If I could just leave you with one thing, it's, this prophetic stuff is never to scare you. You're, we're never to think like, oh my gosh, the world is falling apart. No, it's falling right into place because our Heavenly Father has a plan. 
He's got a ton, thousands of promises throughout Scripture to comfort us, to encourage us, to build us up. Just take a peek at some of them. Guard your mind with hope. Guard your, your heart with God's love, with faith and love, the breastplate. Protect yourselves with this reminder of God's love. Live expectantly. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we've had tonight. Thank you, God, that we've had the truth of Scripture shared, Lord. Thank you for these promises. Thank you for giving us a glimpse of what's going to take place, Lord, after you have claimed your bride, the church, the body of believers. Lord, help us to live with this information, expecting and hoping in your return, Lord, not squandering any opportunities to share the love of Christ with others. Lord, we know that you're, you're going to be pouring out your anger on sin, and that sin is a barrier taken down by Jesus himself. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you'd like to know that all your sin is gone, deleted, if you'd like to know that that debt between you and the Lord is gone, that your sin's forgiven, if you'd like to know where you'd spend eternity, then we'd like to pray with you. You can pray out loud with us or you can pray in the intimacy of your own heart. It's a simple prayer, inviting Jesus into your life. And it goes like this, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can serve you from this day forward. And all of God's kids agreed by saying, amen, amen, church. Well, church, God bless you. It's, man, if no one's told you that they love you, church, I love you, Packing House. God bless you guys, and good night. Wait a minute. Anybody know who won the Super Bowl? Who? No one cares? All right. Well, good night. God bless you guys. Good night.